All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us in person and online for the next session in the uh, Founder University of Nevada series. And today we're going to talk about creating a product and calculating costs, which uh, is really important. I, I talked to our speaker, Bill, earlier today. It's not as glamorous as some of the marketing things or raising capital things that many founders really all focus on, but it's definitely one of the very important uh, nitty gritty business operations, sales operations things. So it's a very important topic. So Bill's going to go into it, some of his experience and uh, give some insight on that. Bill is the CIO, CMO, and co-founder of CID Inc., which is a startup and accelerator member. Uh, and he's the inventor of the patented technology that's used for the basis of CID's technology. He is also a United States Air Force veteran, probably served as, a F uh, served as an F-15 crew chief. He's a master automotive technician. He's a published author in that, in that, in that series, contributed over 14 technology books in that area. And he has over 10 years of business development experience, managing over $30 million in annual sales for ICP Inc. And I will lend uh, the time back to Bill now to tell you, fill in any blanks there and uh, kick us off on this presentation. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the warm introduction. Um, as stated, I'm doing this from experience of standing up a from scratch uh, hardware software solution company. And that's what we're going to focus on. We might delve into a little bit when it comes to um, off the shelf products and stuff that can be purchased into it. But when it comes down to it is how is it that you're actually in the end going to generate a revenue stream and what costs are involved when it comes down to that. And that's what we're going to delve into. Um, so let's first first kick it off with when it comes for businesses, since I'm approaching businesses to try and save them money, trying to save them time, trying to increase the safety and security of their operation, what value are you creating for a company to be able to purchase your project? And, this, and when it comes to creating value, you have to look at it in two ways. It's whether the individual is making a purchase or whether the business is making a purchase. Because from what they're currently doing to make that change, it has to have effect at least one of these three areas in order for them to make a change in their costs. Okay, because normally when you're coming into a business or an, having an individual approach you, they are looking at it in that, in that uh, type of value. And that's really important for us to understand how they buy so that you can convince someone to buy your service, your product, your solution, and the way you approach it. Relationships get the deal closed, but understanding how they buy is really, really important, such as brand recognition, such as, is this the best value of your product? And in the end, are they really saving them money? Because that's what it comes down to. And your biggest cost in an organization period is actually going to be your labor when it, when it comes down to it. And if you can change their cost of labor for any type of business, or you improve that, that cost, then guess what? Normally people are gonna make a change if it's substantial enough. Micro changes such as a 5% cost in labor, unless you have a 5% cost on a 60,000 employee organization, it's not gonna do it. Small businesses, if it's 5%, normally not gonna do it because it's too much to the reorganization of the company in order for them to be able to absorb that minor of a change. But those are the three areas that a business is always going to look out when it comes to a costing of an organization. Am I going to be saving money? Am I going to save time? Am I increasing the security and the safety of the environment when op operations? And one of the technologies that we actually sell um, is a forklift collision avoidance technology. What is important about that technology is <clears throat> what it changes in safety and efficiency, because if you can increase efficiency and lower the cost for infrastructure in a, in a workplace, most entities are gonna, uh, gonna make that purchase. And with our forklift collision technology, we vastly increased safety to where some organizations can see safety incidents go down to zero when it comes to just forklift collisions. And those are huge sell points, but, Am I saving them money by implementing a safety system? No, I'm not saving them money because it's another layer of cost. So these values are still important. Doesn't mean that you're gonna hit all three areas all the time. 
If you can hit all three areas, that's a huge win for your go-to-market strategy with a company to be able to hit all three. And if you're only affecting one, it's an uphill battle because you really have to have a competitive advantage on top of your marketplace presence. Who else is in the market with you? So we're, now let's go into some of the costs. Initial costs for software hardware when it comes to IoT. And granted, this is an experience that I have when it comes down to it. It's probably going to be different for any different types of company. And let's just talk about initial startup and programming of software for you to do it. And what is IoT? It's Internet of Things. It is getting data from the edge of an operation, such as in logistics. Where is the... What's the tire PSI on a vehicle that's transporting um, goods across town? If that tire blows or it has its worst day, guess what? It can affect the shipment of, of any type of organization. And you're trying to get information to the decision maker that, hey, this information is important for them to affect their operations in those three areas. Increase safety increase uh, efficiency, and uh, save money. Is a tire sensor gonna save money on an operation? No, it actually adds costs to an operation, but it does improve in two areas. So that's still a good thing. But let's take a look at initial costs for a hardware and software. So you have to have someone design it. How, how is this thing gonna function? It's gonna, and it takes a lot of personnel to do it. So you initially have a huge initial investment in labor in order for a design, even a design system to be able to go through. Your program director or your CTO, salaries from your architect lead, your programmers, your, and, and then quality testing your product before you even do an initial release to do it. And most companies that are in IoT will take some type of hardware that's off the shelf and see if they can modify it in some way and make it operate the way they want to in order to do it. And that's normally to say, hey, prototyping, this is what we're doing, but here's the future and this is where we're headed. And this is the modifications we're gonna do that's gonna set us apart to be able to work. So you have a huge initial software cost with test and documentation, embedded lead uh, programmers. These are huge upfront costs that you have to figure out how I'm gonna get money when I go to market. And again, are you answering the three areas that a business is gonna purchase in those areas? Again, safety, improve efficiency, and save them money. That's what you're trying to do. But as a business, these are all costs that you have already in order just to get your product to market already. And then on the hardware side, you're, you have to put a team together that's gonna test and understand the products that you have or what it's gonna to take to get that product through prototyping into manufacturing and then get it to market to where you're not having a lot of warranty and social calls. Already, we have about a $2.3 million lift just with these initial costs. And then we haven't even talked about our fixed costs when it comes down to it. rent, having lab, all the, the, the software licenses. like. Until you own a business, how many times do you actually have to repurchase Microsoft Office just so that you can get together on Teams and do PowerPoint presentations about statuses where you're at or you're writing Word documents? Those are all costs that come into this. And these are all things that they add up really quickly and they become part of your fixed annual costs on top of your rent, on top of everything else that goes just to getting it to market. And let's get into some of the recurring costs, product support. So when you actually have a, a, a customer and they're having problems, normally what we recommend is you set up a tiered approach for your customer. As you stand up a customer, they have a, uh, a, a huge training session. You get a couple of their super users to train, hey, this is where we're going to go. So that in their organization, they're taking the phone call of, did you turn the computer on and off? Did you reset the system? Is your internet working? Because if you as an organization take that on, your costs start to skyrocket because you have to have someone available at the phone lines to be able to take all those costs. And so then that changes your cost per second. And then you have 
reoccurring product development that's going to be going on. So as you're selling to customers, you have to stay viable in the marketplace because if you just stick with one widget to be able to go to market, normally you're not going to have a staying power in that marketplace presence because someone's going to find a new, faster, better widget than what you do, and you have to keep developing your, your system. Such as, and we hear it in the market all the time when it comes to like 3G, we went to 4G because we can communicate more and it was a different bandwidth. We went from 4G to 5G. We're talking huge about 5G right now because it's very viable, but guess what's already on the horizon? 6G. And these are all thought processes that you have to consider as a business owner to be able to take something to market. And then where other costs that are always forgot about. Data storage is a huge one because you have to save all the history for your customers plus what you're doing when it comes to product development. Web hosting, oh my God, do I, do I hate how much we're, uh, we spend when it comes to web hosting. Granted, uh, and each business is gonna have their own costs when it comes down to that. Whether it's on GoDaddy, you're paying somebody to, to build your page if you have that, but each time you do an update, you have to go through and say, oh yeah, I like this visual, I don't like this visual. All those have costs in order for you to be able to go to market. And all these costs tell you what you're gonna get to when it comes to how you price going to market and how are you gonna recover through your revenue stream, your business viability. And that's the focus of this. Okay, so right now, this is the initial, we have about 1.3, 1.03 million in software, hardware is 1.2, plus your recurring yearly costs. We're already at 3.2 million in the first year just to get to year two and we haven't sold a thing. So when it comes to a pricing strategy, that's the next thing that you have to think about when it comes to being able to go to market. When it comes to software and IoT, the way you wanna think about it is, I'm not gonna, with the first fish I got on the line, I'm not gonna get all my money back. Because if you price it out that the customer is gonna say, I have a $3.25 million bill in order for you to purchase my project, guess what? The customer's probably not going to do it because it's way too expensive. Because if you're looking at an organization and you need to change and it's just a 10% change in cost and they only have 500 employees, guess what? They're probably not going to buy your service because it's not a cost factor that's enough for them, especially when you're looking at a huge revenue stream. So flagship customers, and what we say is flagship are customers that pay their bill, on a regular time, normally they're part of the Fortune 500 or even the Fortune 100, whoever is gonna be your target market. The reason why you want it to be a flagship is because they pay their bills on time and normally they think about costing something out over a period of time. So five years is a normal costing period for them. And if you can take what you have in costs and try and recover that, for your 10 flagship customers in the first five years of operation for your first initial product development, normally you have covered your initial development costs. So for each customer, you're looking at first year contract being about 150 dollars to $250,000 for initial pilot and project. Because over five years, your goal is to get to about 3.25 million and you have recurring revenue streams when it comes to that, that keeps on initial development to keep moving forward and forward. And then anybody above your 10 years, your, your 10 flagpole customers, guess what? That's, that's what we call sticky toffee pudding. That's where you're, you have your bonus customers, they're paying for now, how can you move even more rapid into the, the market? Because normally as you're capturing more customers, you can spend more money to capture more customers. But your goal is to get to 10. That's what we always think of it as, is it powers of 10. If I can get 10 flagship customers to help pay for my development through pilot projects, then guess what? I'm starting to generate revenue for my company. And there's four areas in the billing how you can start to recover that from your customers. 
initial hardware sales, because you always have, for IoT, you always have a hardware cost. Okay, the next is your annual software license of your product and services. And you always want to line those out a little bit differently because everyone looks at those costs in an organization a little bit different how this can go. Like if I have to replace my cell phone, I want to, uh, in an organization, am I looking at buying iPhone 14s for everyone in my organization? A small company, when it's 10 people, and those are average of 15 bucks a piece, that's $15,000 just in phones right there. So that's a huge substantial cost. But in an organization that already has a technology that they've implemented, you got to say, hey, you got to get rid of that because that's old and obsolete. You got to come over and make this hardware purchase so that you can actually have it. So do you actually need an iPhone 13 for this business to do? No, you might just need a smartphone that's able to do what, it's, what it needs to do for that business and, and to gather data and to be able to communicate with your devices. So iPhone 14 is on a luxury end. And I go into a business and say, hey, we can do a technology change. You're still being able to operate in the same way, except here's your technology. We can do it with a $150 smartphone that it has to have this basic minimum. If you want to buy it or we supply it as part of a project, we can do it that way and you're overcoming a lot of obstacles. So initial hardware sales. The next is, uh, is your installation, integration, and training. And this, everyone understands that we gotta have an expert that comes in to do an installation on a project. They always have to do an installation and to get the system up, to tune it up, and then to integrate with the software that they might have. Like we're, for our solution, when it comes down to it, normally we will integrate with an ERP, an enterprise uh, resource program. And what that does is allows an organization to see what's going on with its organization in, in terms of jobs, in terms of movement of their logistics and supplies, and to be able to move that all forward. And there's always an integration in that. But there's also, that program also will have maintenance and updates too that can affect your integration with that program. And you always have to stay up on that. The last is making sure that they have a super user in there that knows your system just good enough to get everyone into trouble, but you're not having to take all those calls to, did you power it up? The typical IT, did you restart your phone? Have you cleared your, your cookie cache? You know, do you have a good internet connection? Because as soon as you take that call, your firm as a software company automatically has a labor cost that's involved with that because you're, you're having a trained engineer that knows your system answer that call to be able to do it. And then there's long-term, um, the reoccurring costs that go along with it. And normally what that is, when I say long-term, it's your maintenance costs for owning it over a period of time. So as they start using your system, probably in the first six months, there's going to be a flurry of phone calls. Say, oh my gosh, the program's doing this, this, I'm not familiar with it. Could you walk me through this? The last two years in operation, you're probably not going to get any of those phone calls because the super users and the users at the organization that are licensing you, guess what? They know the system well. They've been playing with the program for a while. They, they can research through your help, your articles and your updates how to fix the system and if they have a problem or how to add new users, remove users, change access without getting you as a firm involved. Now we're gonna delve into pricing strategies and I'm gonna focus on three areas, but I wanna to touch on pricing strategies are really important for you to understand how to be able to go to market. This is a great video, I do recommend it. Um, Dan gives a great background on all of these areas and can really help out any type of organization that's trying to start. And we, uh, we used him as a little bit of a reference here. But when it comes to our piping uh, strategies, we have first to start out uh, benchmark prices. Who, who else is in the market? Can I be competitive against them? Such as I have the rubber ball that uh, my competitor selling it for $1.25, can I sell mine for $1.10 and put him out of business to be able to do? And everyone understands that cost structure, break even, you know, 
cost plus. So what is my cost? And then am I gonna, what do I wanna turn for a profit? I normally don't recommend this strategy because normally you're in a marketplace that such as a Frisbee. You know, there's a, a million Frisbee manufacturers out there. Well, actually there's probably only two normally when you whittle it down. But when it comes to selling the, the Frisbee out there, how do you get competitive? when it comes down to making those costs. It's cost plus or break even. Then it's time. Uh, most contractors are involved in this, especially like if you're building a home. All right, it's gonna take me this many hours to frame your house. And this is what you're gonna pay me an hour. And if I go into overtime, this is my rate plus. Most uh, contractors will also have some type of um, price costing built into it that includes medical for them and their insurances and covers and liabilities for that project. And so normally like a lot of people say, well, I'm, my labor rates $25 an hour. That's might be what they get paid, but the labor rate that's sold might be 75 to hundred dollars an hour for the skill set that that individual has. And each person you get involved in that skill set, it's gonna go higher and lower. Like anybody in this room is paid for a lawyer uh, each, each lawyer is pretty proud of their prices. And that's a great uh, analogy when it comes to rate-based, um, uh, when it comes to pricing. The next is packaging, bundling. Hey, if you get this, you also get this, this. That can create uh, a lot of issues in itself because it also layers in costs, but it's also, it's a, you're creating a value there. And that's uh, many different things. Positioning, scarcity, we've all felt that effect. Uh, look at when it comes to um, oil prices as they go up and down, guess who gets affected? Uh, us as the um, user because we have to absorb all those costs. The state also makes more money on it by the more we purchase, but they make more money when it's scarce because guess what? Prices are inflated just because of uh, that next. The, the one that's closest to my heart is actually value. Uh, and we're going to delve into that uh, in big detail here, just because it's really important. The other is geographic. Uh, Netflix is a perfect example of that. What we pay for Netflix here in the United States versus what they pay in South America is totally different. But they also have different access to different things, too. So uh, uh, geographically, that works out a lot on a global uh, scale, but you have to know the market you're in. And when it comes to international, oh, that gets crazy when it comes to pricing because their labor rates versus US labor rates are out the window most of the times. Then uh, let's talk a, a little bit about emotional. We'll get into that here in just a bit um, because emotional really, uh, when it comes to religious items, as one of our guests here was talking about, to me, I, I would put that in emotional pricing. Uh, also, like when it comes to purchasing uh, different things such as uh, do I want to pay $3 for something when I could pay $2.99 for it? We'll get into that here in a second. Uh, last is skimming price adoption curve. So just staying out just above where it's painful for some people to be able to adopt and affect it in those three areas. I don't really, really recommend it because your prices are always changing on a, on a, on a daily basis. Then uh, penetration. You're trying to capture a market as quickly as possible and affect everyone else growth in a marketplace. So you're basically cutting your prices at a huge discount so that you can get into a, a, a marketplace and then start to raise your prices as, as you've captured market. Because most people won't change over when it comes to a, a penetration. Once you've captured them, they're normally not gonna leave because of the cost of adoption. But if it's a steep enough discount and then you slowly start raising their prices, guess what? You're already in there and you already have a contract with them. So, and then the last one we're gonna get into, so the value emotional and uh, variance of free. Meta is really good at variance of free. Come to Facebook, take a look at everyone else's feed. You can stay connected, but guess where they're making money? Every time you click on it, you're looking at advertisements, you're seeing different things. And they're also capturing a lot of data on you that they can sell. So there's a, a variant of free. It is free, but someone's got to foot the bill eventually, whether it's going to be the customer or the businesses in, in the back way. So, okay, so let's delve into the price and strategy. Emotional. <clears throat> 
Perception and pricing. We've talked a little bit about it, but let's let's delve into that a little bit. Most people, when you're on vacation, people, as we're here in Las Vegas, a lot of people, uh, emotional pricing is here. It's like, I'm in Vegas. I'm here to have a good time. If it costs me a little bit of extra in order to be entertained in Las Vegas, guess what? They're going to spend it. If most people went on vacation and had access to the quality food that they do here in Las Vegas, they would not pay those prices, except when they're on vacation. But here in Vegas, we have a huge job because it's an emotional. I'm here in Vegas. Eh, it is what it is. And so room pricing, you can get a lot when it comes to that. And then sales and specials. Come in, buy one, get one free. But you have to buy minimums. You know, hey, I really want this uh, Oreo cookie package where it's two and a half. But guess what? Uh, it's two and a half bucks. But if you buy four packages, you can get it down to $1.99. Oh, well, I know I'll eventually eat four packages, but do you really need to buy four packages of Oreo cookies at that time? No, it's ballooning your, your, your purchase. And, but guess what? Oreos, uh, they're making money because you just bought four and it might even be the same normal price, comparative pricing. Place an expensive item next to the stand, controlling search. And then, dude, I, I, I really love this one. Uh, when you're walking down the aisle and you're, you're, there's stuff hanging on the, the supermarket and for some reason you're looking at cake and you have a whisk right there. Oh yeah, I just broke my whisk, so I'm going to buy a whisk. Or I need a funnel to be able to resupply my sugar and there's funnels right there next to jars. Those are all emotional decisions because uh, normally they're small priced items that if you add it to, normally people don't associate, oh, yeah, I do need that, but I'm not too worried about price because it's probably cheap if it's right here. So visuals, fonts, colors, that's more on the marketing side. I'm not a big expert when it comes to that, but having to research what colors work, what don't. Uh, heck, Bud Light right now has had a big hit when it comes to emotional pricing. You know, um, and that's 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 policies, and those are things that can affect your market presence too. So, let's get into variants of free. Oh my god! Uh, to me, I've always, I don't know how business can stay in operation when it comes to this, but they do. It's because of, um, well, it, it, it it's just amazing because people keep pumping them up money, and let's get into Meta a little bit. Facebook, when it comes to Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook, they have huge costs in order for them to be able to operate. Think of the data centers that they need just to have in place to have 1 billion users actively on their sites every single day, just in hosting costs alone. You thought our data costs at $25,000 a year were huge. You're, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars a year just to run a data center. And yet as the user, the customer, no one has ever paid for the use of Facebook. But where, why is Facebook still in business and making money? Because it's on a smart device and it's generating data usage. For cell phone companies, it's creating uh, revenue streams because guess what is you're going through looking at feeds you're getting the news and updates and you're getting hey this person just bought this and they went shopping here and that's information for companies such as marketing that are trying to sell you the next widget trying to sell you the next thing and all those are data but the largest customer for meta it's free but where they're making their revenue is by selling data by selling storage and by marketing. They're technically a marketing company. They're not, a, it's not a Facebook, it's a marketing company. Okay. Giving away, hey, if you get this free when it comes to purchasing a product and many, many people do it too. Like, hey, uh, when you're doing a market research for a company, hey, you can come in and you get the initial report. I wanna understand what this company is doing and how they're gonna stay viable for the next year. You'll get a taste of a report for free 
for the first three paragraphs of the report. And it's enough of a summary that you're like, I need more information to be able to do. That's when you have to buy the program. Not as a consumer, it's frustrating, but guess what? Someone really wants that information, they're gonna pay for it, but you need enough information to be able to make that decision. So consumables are also important when it comes down to it. Uh, so for us, one of the things that, that is a loss leader for us is actually our, our ad, uh, adhesive to, for our hardware to be able to, to glue to something. And hey, we got to adhere it. And are, am I going to keep charging the customer every single time? Initially, yes, but sometimes it fails and you're giving it away, or there's something in that program that's always going to be free. So, but last, let's get into value delivery. Okay, this is where this is one of my most favorite areas because you can really change your cost perspectives. Uh, if you're going for a value position. And I want you to think about this in a way that you're having a conversation with your best friend, but everyone has moved and you got to convince somebody to help you move. How do you convince somebody to help you move? <laughs> you're going to break your back helping me to get my stuff all the way uh, to, into a new location and you get no direct benefit. Oh, I got pizza, I got pizza at the end, but you're creating a value in that pizza. Hey, this is worth your time. This is worth you making me happy to be able to do it. And you're creating a value. You have just convinced somebody to do something that, that could physically hurt them and cost them time for a reward of pizza, but it only benefits you. So when it comes down to it, you're creating a value. Now think about the price of a moving company on what they would charge the movie for that day. Most of them for a typical four bedroom house will do it for about a, a grand, it's $1,200 for the day. That includes the truck rental, that includes the uh, labor to, to move you, to uh, transport it across town or wherever, and then to unload the vehicle to be able to do that. So you have just created value with your friends that actually is about 1,200 bucks. That's, that's a huge thing. Now, how do you price that going into the, the, into the market? And that's what's in, in, uh, really, really important because you're creating value in the, what, in the three areas. Again, what are the three areas? Saving money, saving time, and increasing safety, security, slash when it comes down to it. But if you're doing it in those three areas, guess what? you can normally price higher. Um, you have, you'll have a fixed cost. We already got to the point where for initial software and hardware development for the first two years, we could be looking at a cost of about $3.25 million and how to be able to sell that. But your goal is to create more of a value for your product so that you can expand your revenue stream. And how do you do that in certain areas? So for us, well, one of the things that we do is we go in, we've already created all, all this information. Then after we've captured and we have their full attention for the next five years, guess what? The year we come back in and say, hey, this is what we saw from your data as some of the bottlenecks. So I can add value from the same people that are already working for me. I can do consultant fees on top of that. So I can say, hey, if we do some improvements in this bottleneck, we like you possibly add a door on this pathway or even a wider door, you can, you can get more stops and goes through here or more deliveries through this, this bottleneck because you're creating data and data creates a lot of information. And that's, that's the point is to capture and keep expanding your revenue base, even with the customers that you have. And you do that by creating a value, a value in something that's important for them. And that takes you to learning your customer as you go. So again, we're getting back to how does your process create value for your customer? It could be in one area, it could be in all three. If you have it in all three areas, you have a win because most companies are gonna adopt it and be able to move forward. And that's what's really important. 
I think this is it. Bill, appreciate you. That was really, I guess, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, round of applause for Bill. <laughs> Bill, I've got a couple of questions online for, uh, that, are, that are pretty in depth. They might take they might take a few minutes to parse out. Okay. Um, they're from Robert, so I can get to those. So I think I'll do Robert's first question, and then we'll look for anyone online who wants another one, and, and we'll be here in the room, and then we'll just kind of go back and forth. But the first question, and this this was from early on in the presentation, so he, you may have addressed some of this. Um, Bill, our renewable energy hardware product uses uses a lot of steel and steel prices are volatile. Do you know how we can mitigate risk? And I'm assuming that, you know, obviously into costs or pricing. Uh, so steel, that's, that's a real interesting thing because a lot of people consider that a, com uh, a commodity component and it's about the relationships. Normally, uh, when it costs to steel, normally you have a, the further, the closer you have it to when it's an ore in a relationship is how you mitigate risk. Because if you can be a part of the processing from when it's first manufactured to where it gets to you, instead of having all the layered on delivery costs, that's where you have a win. Um, but still, it's kind of like food volatility, corn prices. It's really difficult to mitigate pricing when it comes to something that you have to do. Uh, the more suppliers that you do have in your stable that you can purchase from, when there's volatility, you can actually pivot to say, okay, I'm going to purchase from this person because they uh, can give me the best price at this time. And it's all about relationship. That's a difficult one, but it's something that every, every business has to deal with. Never try, never try and stick with one uh, supplier. Always have a uh, another avenue of supply because if that supplier fails guess what you're up uh poop creek <laughs> and that's not a good thing there you go so, appreciate um robert you can maybe elucidate on that if you want but i'm sorry to get into other questions a little bit later uh before we get to the next question online are there any questions in the room all right so one from rick uh, Bill, will you speak a bit deeper on emotional value? For example, uh, I read an article on how women women charges higher prices because of the emotional connection they have created Apple with their packaging. Other examples that you have seen that have worked well with startups? Oh, that's that's always a tough one um, because Lululemon has uh, an emotional um, trigger on something that I'm not familiar with. And mainly this is because it's, I'm not the target market. Uh, when it comes to little women, but they've done really well because to me, from the, the feedback that I'm getting, they're associating a success, woman empowerment uh, when it comes to that brand. And it's a very successful one. When you can do associations and, and uh, emotional pricing happens a lot, especially when it comes to brands, not just little women, but let's talk about alcohol branding on the market, you know, emotional um, pricing and emotional capture is really huge. If uh, the, the example for on the alcohol side would be um, the Deadpool actor, um, Reynolds, Ryan Reynolds, Brian Ren or Ryan Reynolds. He made a fortune selling his gin company because he really made an emotional attachment. If you drink my gin, you're going to be cool like me. It's a great success. And the normal gin on the market, it's still good gin. And there's not a lot of gin operations out there, but he created a lot of emotional value in a company. And it's the same thing. That normally takes a specialist for a particular marketplace to be able to go in to create that emotional pricing schedule. And a lot of research when it comes down to that. Uh, normally universities have some type of marketing department that will love to help delve into that when it comes to research. And I always recommend going into that. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that last point you hit on those types of ventures really require that the founder or executive team have a really in depth. They're from that industry. They understand that industry. They understand that. Like, 100%. Because otherwise it, I'm assuming it factors in your, your costs. If you don't have expertise, you're paying for developing that expertise and it, your costs go up essentially. 100% and it really changes it. If you're not the expert in it, 
you got to pay somebody to be that expert. Yep. Or you're going to make yourself the expert. There you go. Uh, another question from Robert. Uh, 25 years ago in aerospace, solar panels for satellites, uh, the president, I'm assuming that kind of caused to treat everything as a process then improve. Sorry, Robert, I feel free to elucidate that's a statement. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to move on to your next question. So we're about to put up our third, our third test for our solar product mm -hmm. at, yeah, at, the, at UNR. We may need to buy into the project to make it an appropriate ROI for UNR. What's your experience in buying in to get a new product moving? So it's a, uh, when it comes to get a product, product to any product moving, it, it all is about relationships in the, the marketplace. Um, for solar panels, guess what? Who could be potentially your biggest effect and success? Department of Energy. Here and if you start attending those groups, start attending those types of meetings. If you get buy-in from the federal government on this is a, a a better system, and they also have development dollars when it comes to the Department of Energy to develop your technology to lower your costs via grants, then you can really start to get some buy-in. And then here, guess what? When it comes to solar, what's your competitive edge? over everyone else. It's gotta be pretty substantial change in order for you to have success. And the only way you're gonna can get that is if you have a lot of scientists screaming, oh my gosh, this widget is better than the other widget that's out there. And in solar, you can actually do that a lot by, via grants through the Department of Energy, states have them too, um, but there's a lot of way to be able to, to rec recoup some of those costs of development. But getting down to it, it's about immersing yourself in that marketplace and getting to all their meetings and conventions and start branding yourself. Gotcha. Thanks, Bill. Um, and Robert, you can uh, you can add some more elucidation on that if you want, or if there's anything else you want to ask in that regard. Uh, and a question from Dan: What are your thoughts on the controversial tactics some known founders slash CEOs have used to minimize costs, such as not paying rent or vendors, etc. Seems like there's no accountability, but it seems to work for them. I, I, I have a big problem with that because in, in business, your integrity is everything to be able to move something forward. And it, it's about you being able to accomplish the task when someone plates, uh, does a purchase order with you. So if a company is not paying their bills, if they're not paying their, their staff, that's a big red flag for me as a customer um, and as someone that potentially be doing business. So I always have a problem with that. Um, and I try to steer clear of people that, that don't. Now, as a founder, sometimes you have to make choices and hopefully it's never at the bottom line, such as I'm not gonna pay my rent this month to do it. Because if you're having to make that decision at that time, the decisions that led up to it, already have created you a problem. So when it comes down to it, um, yeah, that's a big one. Pay your bills, uh, take care of your employees. That's some of the core values that we have and uh, perform. When you say you're gonna do something, make sure you do it. Dan says uh, he loves that. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Uh, any questions from uh, in the room at all at this point? Questions, I do wanna thank everyone for joining us this uh, this uh, session. Uh, please join us for the next session, the product validation series on the 20th, so next week. Also, the Founding University series has now moved to an online portal that covers all these topics, all the recordings are there, uh, and you know, Founder University registrants can gain access to that online community and, the, and those materials. So please check that out. You likely have been communicated with that already, but we're very excited about that. It's a great way for you to utilize reference and then practically apply the information that our great speakers such as Bill are kind of bringing to the table here. Thank you those uh, joining us online and in the room. We will see you all next week.